Charles Darwin set off on a fateful voyage that would revolutionize our understanding of life's great diversity. The voyage of the Beagle took nearly five years. It wove its way from the Cape Verde Islands and along the coast of Brazil. It was in Argentina that he made his first important discovery. Early on in the voyage, Darwin found some amazing fossils. He dug up some skulls, some jaws, some backbones of what turned out to be giant mammals. Now, these were clearly extinct. And Darwin began to ponder, what was the relationship of those fossils to the living animals of South America? But one port of call on Darwin's voyage proved more important than all the others. The Galapagos. The Galapagos. This cluster of 13 isolated islands lies 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador in the Pacific Ocean. These islands are home to unusual animals found nowhere else on Earth. Penguins that live at the equator and swim in warm water instead of the frigid seas of the South Pole. Giant tortoises that weigh up to 600 pounds. Iguanas, huge lizards that swim and dive in the sea. Everywhere else, they dwell only on land. Traveling for the first time in the Galapagos, Sean Carroll is seeing the same creatures that so intrigued Darwin. Of all animals, I think these marine iguanas are the greatest symbol of the Galapagos, what I most wanted to see here. And to see them in their native habitat blending against that black rock, just as Darwin described it, it's an absolute thrill. It's a hideous looking creature of a dirty black color, stupid and sluggish in its movements. They are as black as the porous rocks over which they crawl. Darwin meticulously described the iguanas in his diary, but he was far from the scientific authority he would become. The Darwin that arrived here was not the great theorist that we know today. He was a 26-year-old collector, collecting really almost at random any kind of plants, any kind of animals, any kind of rocks. He didn't even know the meaning of what he was collecting until much later. He was also fascinated by the giant tortoises, which allowed him to ride on their backs as they slowly lumbered around. I frequently got on their backs, and then, upon giving a few raps on the hinder part of the shell, they would rise up and walk away but I found it very difficult to keep my balance. Darwin measured the creature's extreme slowness, about four miles a day, he calculated. But the local people knew something else about the tortoises. That they could tell which island any tortoise came from just by looking at its shell. Their shells differed depending on which island they lived on. Some tortoises had shells shaped like a dome. Others had shells arcing over their heads like a saddle. Others differed subtly in color, or by how much the bottom of the shell flared out. Darwin had literally been sitting on a clue a way to understand the great diversity of life. But he didn't yet realize it. Instead, Darwin turned his attention to birds. The islands were full of what seemed to be a familiar assortment of species.
So he stuffed his collecting bag with what he thought were types of finches, grosbeaks, wrens, and blackbirds. And then, after five weeks in the Galapagos, Darwin and the Beagle went to other ports in the Pacific, and finally set sail for home. On board, he started to sort through the vast number of specimens he had collected on the five-year voyage. But it was not until he returned to Britain that he was able to make sense of them. It began with a startling revelation. All the different birds he had collected actually were variations of a single type. He learns that those birds he had collected on the Galapagos actually represent 13 different species of finch. What misled Darwin was that they looked radically different. Some had wide, tough beaks. Others had long, slender ones. And these differences depended on which islands they lived on. Now, why would that be? Why would there be slightly different birds, slightly different species, on different islands, all in one part of the world? Darwin now thought back to the Galapagos tortoises. They, too, differed from island to island. His brain began racing. Thoughts are starting to crystallize, take shape in his mind, bit by bit, bit by bit. He starts this process he describes as mental rioting, just stream of consciousness, where he's jotting down note after note after note, thoughts as they occur to him. And finally, they converge on this one idea. What Darwin now realized was that somehow, for some reason, species change. Originally, there must have been just one type of finch in the Galapagos. But over time, it had diversified into many kinds, with different beak shapes. The same for the tortoises. One type of tortoise must have turned into many kinds, with different shells, depending on which island they lived on. With this great insight, Darwin entered dangerous new territory. The standard view at the time was that God had created every species, and that what God had created was perfect and could not change. But Darwin said, no, why would the creator bother with making slightly different finches for each of these different islands that all looked alike? The prevailing view just didn't make sense. But this was only the beginning of Darwin's revolution. He turned his attention to the fossils he had collected in South America. One was of a giant sloth. Another was of a huge armadillo-like creature. These animals were extinct. But little sloths still existed in South America and so did smaller armadillos. What could this mean? It dawned on him that they resembled each other. So what he had found in the ground were the buried ancestors of the living animals of South America. So again, here was more evidence that species changed. Somehow, these ancient giants must have been transformed into the smaller creatures we see today. But what Darwin would later find out took this idea of how species change into a completely new league. In Victorian times, scientists routinely studied life forms at the embryonic stage. How these tiny forms develop from just a single cell into an entire creature has long been seen as one of the wonders of nature. 
Watching a developing embryo is truly the most glorious miracle of nature. I mean, a, a, you know, no baloney. What Darwin learned from studying the embryos amazed him. In snake embryos, you could see tiny bumps, the bony rudiments of legs. But these would never develop in the adult snake. Darwin wondered, were snakes somehow descended from animals with legs? He learned that whales, which have no teeth as adults, had them as embryos. Those teeth disappeared before they were born. To Darwin, it had to mean whales were descended from creatures with teeth. But human embryos provided the most startling evidence. Under the microscope, tiny slits around the neck were clearly visible. Exactly the same structures were found in fish. But in fish, they turned into gills. In humans, they became the bones of our inner ear. Surely, this showed that humans must be descended from fish. It's an astonishing thought.